Hello, um, this is Past Paper Guy. I'm going to be solving the A-level physics specimen paper, paper 3, 2014. Um, this paper is a paper on mainly practical work and it's quite different to anything that we have seen before so a lot of students are confused about some of the pieces in here. Hopefully I'll be able to help you with some of those things. As always, I would suggest that you look at the paper first. I've included links below um, and hopefully you'll be able to hear me through this video because it is raining so you might be able to hear the, the rain in the background. But here goes. Okay, so section A. There are three questions. So this is question one. Um, it's an experiment to measure free fall. You drop this and this at the same time, they'll move down and then they'll smack into each other. And you can see how far it's gone down by it making a mark on the paper. Right. Uh, question 1.1. .1. Easy to miss questions like this because they don't have a space to write an answer. Um, lots of homeworks come back with people missing questions like this. So we need to figure out what distance to measure. Well, the bit of the ball that's going to hit the plank here is going to be the very, very center of the ball. So we need to measure from the center of the ball there to, and the bit that we want to measure is the very first instance when it hits the paper. So it's going to be falling down that way. And it's going to hit the paper there with the, with the center of the ball. It's going to hit the paper there. So we want to go from the center of the ball to the very right hand edge of that mark. And that is the distance D. The student repeats the procedure several times. The data for the experiment is that. The time for the bar to swing through 10 oscillations is that. So what is the time for one oscillation and how? what's the time for it to reach the vertical position and hit the ball? So um, the time for one oscillation is easy. It's 15.7 divided by, and the number of oscillations is 10, so that's 1.57 seconds. So T, well, how far does it have to go? If you think back to here, uh, one oscillation is all the way to there and all the way back again. So we're interested in it going just one quarter of the way. So T is equal to the time period divided by four, which work that out. So 1.57 divided by 4 gives us 0 0.3925. That's to 3 sig fig. So we need this to 3 sig fig, 0 0.393 seconds to 3SF. Okay. Determine the percentage uncertainty in the time measured T and suggest by the precision of the recorded data. So the recorded data is this, so the precision suggested is plus or minus 0.1 second. So we need to go for, now notice that it's 0.1 second, not 0.05 seconds. That's just the rule of AQA. It's always the size of this last decimal place here. So uh, we just do that the percentage uncertainty in the measurement of t is equal to 0.1 divided by 15.7 well, sorry times by 100 I suppose if you want it as a percentage so we do 0.1 divided by 15.7 times by 100 gives us 0.6 three, six, nine percent. Um, and as a standard rule, I'd always write your percentage uncertainties to two sig fig. Okay, I, I think you're probably safest doing that. I haven't seen it written down anywhere that that's what you should do, but that's what all the answers in all the past papers seem to be. So I would just do that. Every percentage uncertainty, write to two sig fig. Okay, the percentage uncertainty in the measurement of the time of 10 oscillations is that, so the percentage uncertainty in the measurement of t is also that, but it will be of smaller absolute value, of course. Use data from 
table one to determine a value for D. Okay, so there's um, they've been a bit sneaky here. If you look at these, then this one here is quite significantly different to the others. So they're suggesting that this is an anomaly. And if it is, if you think it's an anomaly, then you should exclude it from your calculation. So I'm going to write that down, excluding 0 0.701 as an anomaly. You get extra points if you can spell it anomaly. There we go. Um, so we just do 0 0.752, 0 0.758, 0 0.746, 0 0.7. 772.769 and we need to divide that by 5. So the average is 0 0.7594, so write it to the same number of DPs as there, so 0 0.7592. Three DP, which is what that's written to. Calculate the absolute uncertainty in your value of D. Okay, to find the absolute uncertainty, we need to first of all find half the range. So, half the range, so we need the highest and the lowest readings, ignoring this one still. So, the highest reading is that one, so it's 0 0.772 take away the lowest reading, which is that one. So 0 0.746, and we divide that by two. So let's do that. 772, take away 0 0.746, divided by two, gives us a value of plus or minus 0 0.013. Now, that is the answer, but we do need to check one other thing, which is what's the precision of the instrument? Well, we seem to be using a ruler here, which appears to be precise to plus or minus one millimeter. So it's half a millimeter at one end of the ruler, half a millimeter at the other end of the ruler, which gives you plus or minus one millimeter. So here's your ruler. When you line something up, say I wanted to measure D here, um, I've got half a millimetre out there, I've got half a millimetre out there, so that adds up to plus or minus one millimetre. So the ruler is plus or minus 0 0.001 metres. Um, this is bigger than this one, so that's the answer that you need, 0 0.013. If this had come out as smaller than that, you would have had to put that in instead. Okay, some often students do one or the other of these two and they forget that they need to do both and pick whichever one is the worst, whichever one has the biggest uncertainty. Right, determine a value for G and the absolute uncertainty in G. So this is a SUVAC question, S equals UT plus a half a T squared. So they can do this now because there's no modules. So uh, we've got the distance is going to be our average value there, 7594. That, the initial speed is zero. We don't care about the final speed. The acceleration is what we're trying to find. And the time was this value here, 0 0.3925. Might as well use all the precision. Um, so we have rearranged this, so that's zero. S equals a half a t squared. So A is equal to 2S over T squared. So that's 2 times by 0 0.7594 divided by 0 0.3925 squared. So putting this calculation in now, 2 times by 0 0.7594 divided by 0 0.3925 squared is that. So that looks about right. Oops. So 9.858. So that's um, 
I've done 3SF there, I've done 3SF there, so we can write this to 3SF, so 9.86 here to 3SF. Right now, they don't give you much space here, but you have to work out the absolute uncertainty as well. So, the absolute uncertainty in G is going to equal the, sorry, the, the percentage uncertainty in G is going to equal the percentage uncertainty in S plus, and we've got T squared, so it's the percentage uncertainty in T times by two, because you've got it, you're multiplying by T twice there, so you need to add in the percentage uncertainty twice. So the percentage uncertainty in S is the absolute uncertainty divided by our mean value times by 100, so it's uh, 0.013 divided by 0.759 times by 100, plus, and the percentage uncertainty in the time was here, 0.64 plus 0.64. Right, so I'm going to do this, so we got 0.013 divided by 0.759, so the absolute uncertainty divided by the mean value uh, times by 100 to turn it into a percentage. So it's about 1.7% for that one. We've got to add in this twice. I'm going to use my non-rounded figure here. So we add that plus 0.6369 times by 2. And we're adding in twice, remember, because we've got a t squared there. So we're using t twice in this equation. So we have to add the percentage of uncertainty in twice. So that gives us... 2.98657 dot 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 percentages. Right, they really don't give you much space to answer this. Now we need to work out the 2.986 blah 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 percent of this value here. So we need to times that by, and it would have helped if I stored this in my calculator memory, but 9.858 divided by 100 gives us 0.294. So we do um, the absolute uncertainty in G is equal to plus or minus the percentage uncertainty, which is 2.9865 dot 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 times by 9.858, see I've gone off there, um, divided by 100, let's turn it into an absolute uncertainty. So we have plus or minus 0 0.29. Now this is really important. This precision here must match that there. So we shouldn't go to four there. We should match the number of decimal places. So that, the DPs, must match. I don't know if I've gone off my video recording there, almost. So the DPs have got to match there and there. So when you're quoting a, an absolute uncertainty, make sure that your last DP of your absolute uncertainty matches the last DP of that. So if, for instance, you had written this as 9.9 .9 meters per second squared, then you should be quoting this one to plus or minus 0.3 meters per second squared because that has to match that. So if you'd written that one to two significant figures, that's one decimal place, that one has to be to the same number of decimal places as that, not significant figures. Okay, so it's a little quirky rule, but you need to use it and you need to be um, ready for it. Right, moving on. Right, moving on to 1.7. Discuss one change that could be made to reduce the uncertainty in the experiment. So let's just remind ourselves what the experiment was. Anything which increases the amount of time would reduce the uncertainty because um, if you increase the amount of time then your percentage error falls because your absolute error is going to be the same. There are other ways you can reduce the uncertainty but I think in general it's Increasing the quant size of the quantities is a really good one to remember because it applies to almost every experiment. So by increasing the time,
of the fall, we reduce the percentage uncertainty and thus improve accuracy. So how do we do that? Because I have to discuss one change. Um, well, to increase the time, if we used a pendulum which was longer from your um, SHM, the time period on the pendulum is 2 pi root L over G. So if you use one that's longer, then that would increase the time period, which would mean that it would take longer to fall down here to hit the ball. So um, uh, we can use a longer pendulum. Okay, use a longer pendulum. The student modifies the experiment by shortening the bar so that the time for an oscillation becomes shorter. The student collects data of distance fallen S and corresponding time T over a range of times. Suggest giving a clear explanation how these data could be analyzed to obtain a value for G. All right, so you need to go back to the equation here that we figured out our single value for G. So we have this equation here. So we have S equals, well, UT is zero, because U is zero. So a half A is G, G T squared. So what we need to do is we need to equate that to Y equals MX plus C. Y is equal to MX plus C. I'm gonna just put a plus naught on here and then I'm gonna link all these terms up. So y links with that, x can link with our other variable, well that's that, c is zero, and that leaves m as this bit here. So we need to um, calculate t squared, plot a graph of y against x, so it'll be S against T squared, and then find the gradient and the gradient is uh, this expression here, so a half G. In meters per second squared. And Finally, what about the y-intercept? Well, the y-intercept should be zero. So the y-intercept should be zero. Probably don't need to write this. Um, it, it would be useful if you were really doing the experiment, because if the y-intercept wasn't zero, then you'd know something was up. Maybe there was a systematic error or something. Right, that is the end of question one.